morning. This is Dallas Thompson for the CBS World News Roundup. The United States and Soviet experts preparing for tomorrow's start of the joint manned space flight. We'll get the story first at Cape Canaveral from Reed Collins. The clock continues to tick off the seconds leading toward the launch, and all is going well. The Saturn rocket's batteries were installed and turned on this morning, and the spacecraft's fuel cells were loaded. Astronaut Thomas Stafford and Donald Slayton and Vance Brand have another day of flying their T-38 trainers and brush on their Russian language. The weather remains the major threat to an on-time launch. NASA has devised a way of launching five minutes, 24 seconds earlier than scheduled if a storm is approaching. Instruments on the ground and aloft on airplanes will measure the potential for lightning. Walter Caprian, of the launch director, says tests show the Apollo can stand a small lightning strike, and he just might launch and take that chance. Under our new criteria, a triggered lightning strike is possible. We might launch under those conditions, but I want to assure you that it would be a lightning strike of a magnitude that would not hurt the vehicle. Caprian and his colleagues admit they are under pressure not to delay the American launch if the Russians are up there waiting. A new kind of competitive pressure, despite the cooperative nature of Apollo Soyuz. This is Reed Collins, CBS News, Cape Canaveral. Now, the Soviet story one day before liftoff. Steve tells us that American reporters covering the project will be operating at a disadvantage. On the eve of the Apollo Soyuz flight, Soviet officials today denied that their pension for secrecy has anything to do with their refusal to permit U.S. correspondents to cover the Soyuz launch from the launch site. They pointed out that U.S. Ambassador Walter Stessel has been invited and will attend, and he will arrive in broad daylight. The Apollo astronauts, when they visited in April, were flown in to Baikonur in the dead of night. This is the first time the Soviets have announced a launch in advance, and the first time a launch will be televised live. Soviet officials today said the practice will be continued if it vindicates itself. The Soviets dodged the question concerning the fact that Apollo could rescue stranded cosmonauts on this mission, but Soyuz could do nothing if the Apollo spacecraft could not return to work. There are no plans for such a contingency, said an official. The crews will come down in their respective spacecraft. Several times during today's news conference, the public address system went dead. Grabbing an operating microphone, the Soviet space flight director said, we were first for such malfunctions. Steve Young, CBS News, Moscow. American Information Radio. This is John Grimes. And at this hour, the joint Soyuz Apollo countdowns continue smoothly for the start of tomorrow's historic joint U.S. Russian space mission. At Cape Canaveral, weathermen say the chance of potentially dangerous thunder and lightning storms appear to be lessening for tomorrow's Apollo liftoff. In Houston recently, ABC Science editor Jules Bergman asked Apollo Commander Tom Stafford if the U.S. and Russian crews are satisfied with the safety of both spacecraft. We don't have any problems. We've had a complete safety assessment, you know, systems analysis of both spacecraft, Soyuz and Apollo, and uh, we're all satisfied we have two fine spacecraft to fly. U.S. Apollo Commander Tom Stafford. Hear live coverage of the joint space mission over many of these information network stations, beginning with the Soviet launch at 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time Tuesday. Coverage of the U.S. launch will begin at 3.40 p.m. Eastern Time Tuesday. To next for CBS and KLBJ News at the tone 10 o'clock. CBS News. There's been a change of plan at the White House relating to President Ford's new energy program. This is Gary Shepard reporting on the CBS Radio Network. CBS News. Reaction to President Ford's new oil price plan is running so far along party lines. This is Gary Shepard reporting on the CBS Radio Network. CBS News. Everything is A-OK -okay as the final countdowns progress toward tomorrow's launches for the joint U.S.-Soviet space mission. I'm Stephanie Shelton, reporting on the CBS radio network, and we have a report from Reed Collins at Cape Canaveral. The international scene is set now. The Russians telling the Cape that the Soyuz countdown is going smoothly. 
The Cape, breathing a sigh of relief because the weather pattern is changing here. A southeast wind aloft offering relief from the daily march of thunderstorms across the Cape. The weather tomorrow might be much improved. The plan calls for the American team to be sleeping when the Soviet crew blasts off from Baikonur. The chief of the astronaut office, John Young, was asked if the astronauts might not set the alarms early. They could if they wanted to. The plan is to uh, show them a videotape of the launch at breakfast time. Stafford, Slayton, and Brand are brushing up on their Russian in the crew quarters today as the countdowns continue. This is Reed Collins, CBS News, Cape Canaveral. More in a moment. The world tonight. Good evening. I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. The first joint space venture in history starts tomorrow, if all goes well. First, the Russians blasting off from their launch pad in Central Asia. Then the Americans, about eight hours later, from their pad in Florida. Two days later, the rendezvous in space. Reed Collins sets the scene at Cape Canaveral. The clocks of detente are peeling off the seconds as Thomas Stafford, Donald Clayton, and Vance Brand practice their second language, Russian, at the crew quarters. Some good news arrived about the weather. The winds aloft have changed to southeasterly, reducing the chance of thunderstorms to about 22% at launch time tomorrow. Launch director Walter Caprian confesses there is heavy pressure on him to get the Apollo Saturn off on time if the Russians in Soyuz are up there and waiting. Elaborate measures have been taken to test the electrical charge in the area at launch time. And Caprian says he would even risk taking a bolt of lightning on the rising rocket if the charge is not too great. That's how badly the United States wants to keep this date. Tomorrow's beginning marks the end. The original Mercury astronaut, Deke Slayton, gets to fly after all at the age of 51, the oldest man of them all. When Leonov and Kubasov blast off from Baikonur, the American crew is supposed to be sleeping. The plan calls for them to see a videotape of the Soyuz launch two hours later when they begin their day of detente. This is Reed Collins, CBS News, Cape Canaveral. For the first time, the Soviet people are learning about the space launch in advance of the event, and fully half the Soviet evening TV news tonight was devoted to the Soyuz Apollo flight. Steve Young tells us about it. Cosmonauts Alexei Leonov and Valery Kubasov had broad praise for the hundreds of technicians who are supporting their part of the joint mission. Temperatures are boiling at the Baikonur launch site in Soviet Central Asia. Leonov was wearing a plaid short sleeve shirt. Kubasov was dressed in a sporty knitted shirt that was white. As is the custom before a Russian space flight, the prime crew visited the home of the late chief Soviet designer of spacecraft and of the dead Soviet space hero, Yuri Gagarin. And there was a report from the Russian correspondent in Houston showing the cover of an American TV magazine featuring the joint flight and an interview with Senate Minority Leader Hugh Scott, who said the mission helped stay time. For the first time today, Soviet space officials sealed the pointed questions from Western newsmen at the press center. They were reminded that the Apollo spacecraft could rescue stranded cosmonauts, but Soyuz could not carry astronauts back to Earth if the Apollo spacecraft should become crippled. The Soviets turned that question aside, saying the plan is for the astronauts and the cosmonauts to return in their own vehicle. Steve Young, CBS News, Moscow. More news after this. American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell, and at this hour, a CIA launch, one of the biggest questions facing American scientists, is being resolved. Details from correspondent Vic Ratner at Cape Canaveral. For the first time in a week, the weather here has improved dramatically. The thunderstorms we've had daily replaced by mostly sunny skies and few clouds. Flight Director Glenn Lunny says his experts predict the weather will be just fine at launch time. If there are any thunderstorms, they'll be earlier in the day and should not interfere with the countdown, which has been smooth as silk. That eases the last big worry about an on-time launch tomorrow. Vic Ratner, ABC News, Cape Canaveral. You can hear live coverage of the joint space mission over many of these information network stations, beginning with the Soviet launch at 8.15 tomorrow morning Eastern Time and the U.S. launch tomorrow afternoon at 3.40 Eastern Time. Pushing up oil prices. That story coming up.
Yes, News. The House of Representatives is in session tonight debating how to move ahead in its intelligence investigation. I'm Gary Landay reporting on the CBS radio network. For the in the Soviet Union, Soviet cosmonaut Valery Kubasov says we are ready to fly. At Cape Canaveral, Chester Lee, director of the American half of the twin launch, says everything is go. The cosmonaut lifts off tomorrow morning. The astronaut, seven and a half hours later, the link-up of the Apollo and Soyuz scheduled for Thursday. As for detente here on Earth in Minneapolis, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Buck continued his campaign of mobilizing public support behind what he described as a big sale of grain to the Soviet Union. This Tonio, it's nine o'clock. Time for news. This is Dan Streeter for American Information Radio with World Wrap Up. The sounds of the news this Monday, July 14th, 1975. In the top of the news, weather looking good for Apollo Soyuz launches. Kissinger criticizes third world nations. Oil decontrol would increase gasoline prices. We'll have those and other stories in a moment. Weather will cooperate with launch teams in the U.S. and the Soviet Union for the unprecedented dual space show of Apollo and Soyuz. We have two reports on the situation. First, here's correspondent Vic Ratner at Cape Canaveral. For the first time in a week, the weather here has improved dramatically. The thunderstorms we've had daily replaced by mostly sunny skies and few clouds. Flight Director Glenn Lunny says his experts predict the weather will be just fine at launch time. If there are any thunderstorms, they'll be earlier in the day and should not interfere with the countdown, which has been smooth as silk. That eases the last big worry about an on-time launch tomorrow. Vic Ratner, ABC News, Cape Canaveral. Now for a look at the Russian situation, here's Ernest Weatherall in Moscow. At the Soviet launch site at Baikonur in Central Asia, where the temperatures hover around 114 degrees, everything seems to indicate the blast out there will be on schedule. The weathermen say there will be no sandstorms in the desert area, and thunder and lightning are strangers to the Central Asian launch site. This is Ernest Weatherall, ABC News, at the Soyuz News Center in Moscow. Hear live coverage of the joint space mission over many of these information network stations, beginning with the Soviet launch at 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Coverage of the U.S. launch begins at 3.40 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. CBS News. Secretary of State Kissinger issues a stern warning to the militant Third World members of the United Nations. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Kissinger spoke Monday. Looks good for Tuesday afternoon's launch of joint mission with two Soviet cosmonauts. The countdown is going smoothly at this hour for both launches in both countries. The mission begins at 8.20 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, when the two Soviet spacemen will be sent aloft from Central Asia. The three Americans are to be launched from Cape Canaveral at 3.50 p.m. Senator Henry Jackson, Democrat of Washington, says he'll take action to try... Journey, a joint expedition into space as America's Apollo attempts to meet and dock with the Soviet Soyuz spacecraft. I'll anchor CBS News coverage with Steve Young in Moscow and Nelson Benton in Houston as we bring you continuous coverage of both launchings, docking maneuvers and landings, plus regular progress reports throughout the flight. Follow Apollo Soyuz with CBS News over the CBS radio network. The stock market... In his building at the Johnson Space Center. All appears to be going well at this hour for tomorrow's joint launch between the United States and the Soviet Union for the historic mission, the meeting in space of the two countries. For a report on the launch conditions in the Soviet Union, Dr. Harry Walsh. Everything seems to be going as planned at the Chiratom launch site in Central Asia. Reports indicate that the Soyuz rocket will be launched tomorrow morning at approximately 7.20 a.m. Houston time. U.S. Ambassador Stussel will be present during the launch of the Soyuz rocket. Meanwhile, at the Cape, all appears to be going well. The feared thunderstorm possibility, or the lightning, has dissipated somewhat. Uh, weather control there now reports that there is only a 20% chance of thunderstorms or lightning activity, and even uh, a minor thunderstorm would not delay the mission, according to launch control at this time. Also, the Soviet ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Dobrian, will be at the site to view the liftoff 
of Apollo. This is David Crane with Dr. Harry Walsh. And that leads the news tonight. I'm Charles Garrett, and this is the Late Night Report from KTRH. Later this hour, we'll hear... Now 12 midnight, Lee Fisher is next. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Dan Streeter, and at this hour, weather forecasters are optimistic that conditions will be satisfactory for the Apollo launch at Cape Kennedy. No weather problems are expected at the Soviet launch site for Soyuz. The U.S. Soviet flight into space is scheduled to begin in just over seven hours. With a report on what may lie beyond the upcoming Space Spectacular, here's correspondent Dick Ratner at Cape Canaveral. Although this is the first joint flight in 14 years of manned space missions, it probably won't be the last. If this one works out, a second Apollo Soyuz mission has been considered, but it's more likely that it will be the 1980s before Americans and Russians meet in space again. That will be the American space shuttle era, and it may carry U.S. astronauts up to dock with a Soviet Salute Space Laboratory. Even farther off is talk here of a joint U.S.-Russian manned space flight to Mars, possibly in the next century. Dick Ratner, ABC News, Cape Canaveral. Hear live coverage of the joint space mission over many of these information network stations, beginning with the Soviet launch at 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Coverage of the U.S. launch begins at 3.40 p.m. Eastern Time. Sharp words from Secretary Kissinger. That story coming up. Latest worldwide news from the American Entertainment Network. Bill Deal reporting. America and Russia are ready to rocket astronauts and cosmonauts into orbit today with final countdowns underway at Cape Canaveral and at the Bakunar Space Center in the Soviet Union. Russian cosmonauts Alexei Leonov and Valery Kobasov climbed aboard their spaceship about an hour ago in preparation for a scheduled liftoff less than two hours from now. Seven and a half hours later, Apollo astronauts Stafford, Brand, and Slayton are to blast off from Cape Canaveral in Florida. ABC's Vic Ratner is there. We've been through a complete analysis of both spacecraft as to what situation could arise, and uh, I think we've answered all the questions. So I don't see any problems. Well, we seem to have some trouble with that report from correspondent Ratner all through the night. The 22-story high Saturn rocket was brightly lit by giant spotlights as work crews cleaned out most of their checkout gear. Moving back to the cocoon-like mobile service structure clears the way for service crews to start fueling the rocket later this morning. It also exposes the Saturn to the weather. An 80-foot tall lightning rod atop the launcher tower protects the delicate spacecraft electronics in case a thunderstorm should happen by this morning. NASA weathermen are predicting mostly sunny skies and no weather problems this afternoon. Good weather also reported for the launch in the Soviet Union. Now this. CBS News. Good luck. Somebody called out in Russian as the two Soviet cosmonauts boarded their spaceship. To the devil, answered Alexei Leonov, the traditional Russian response. Good morning, I'm Charles Osgood, reporting on the CBS radio network. Synchronized countdowns are proceeding without a hitch in a joint American-Soviet space mission. The Americans have several hours yet before their launch at Cape Canaveral, but the cosmonauts are only an hour and 20 minutes away from the leonov kubasov liftoff. Richard Roth reports from Moscow. Soviet Commander Alexei Leonov and his flight engineer Valery Kubasov rode a red and white bus up to their launch vehicle, reported their readiness for flight, and climbed aboard an elevator that slowly lifted them to their Soyuz capsule, perched atop its rocket launcher. They're squeezed into their couches now, undergoing the final medical and communications checks. Soon, the service structure that now surrounds the Soyuz launcher will be pulled back, and in less than an hour, Soviet flight controllers will be checking with their American counterparts for the last report before Soyuz launch that no delays are expected on the American side. That's the word Soviet officials are waiting for because they say everything here is ready and on time. Richard Roth, CBS News, Moscow. More news after this.
Yes, David, the uh, Soviet cosmonauts are in the capsule at the present time. They're checking out the thermal exchange system, the pressurization, temperature, and various other indicator systems, the engine systems, and the systems of the descent vehicle. And about five minutes ago, we got a status report from the Cape, and all is go on uh, the launch of Apollo at 2.50 this afternoon. Uh, the weather conditions uh, appear to be shaping up quite well. The feared thunderstorms are dissipating uh, rapidly. There is only now less than a 20% chance for scattered thunder showers at the Cape. This is David Crane with Dr. Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. And we'll be right back with more news from my good friend uh, sitting right here next to me in just a moment, Ken Krinsky. But remember, today is the last day for the big sale at San Jacinto Sales. Yeah, an old part of town, an old store with a lot of new ideas. For instance, remember that they're featuring Bob Wire on sale through today at sixteen ninety nine. Good morning. This is Dallas Thompson for the CBS World News Roundup. The joint United States-Soviet manned space mission is about to get underway. CBS News live coverage of this historic project begins 15 minutes from now on most of these CBS radio network stations. And five minutes later, at 8.20 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the first major event in the project will take place at the Soviet Space Center in Central Asia. The launching of the Soyuz spacecraft with two cosmonauts on board. Richard Roth reports from Moscow that everything is ready for the flight. The Soyuz stands alone now, a wisp of vapor from the super-cold liquid oxygen propellant rising from the bottom of the vehicle, which has sunk into a 20-foot deep pit. Blue skies with a few light clouds overhead and a broiling desert sun. 41-year-old Soyuz commander Alexei Leonov and 40-year-old flight engineer Valery Kubasov are settled into their couches in the tiny middle section of their Soyuz capsule and flight controllers at Moscow's Mission Control Center a few miles from the press center where foreign correspondents are monitoring the mission all is ready. If there are no problems in just the next few minutes, and there have been none reported all morning, Soyuz will be committed to launch. Kubasov and Leonov were smiling broadly as they reported they are ready for their mission. They paused at the foot of the rocket, and Leonov told Soviet audiences who are hearing the launch broadcast live for the first time that he is honored to pay tribute to the Communist Party and the Soviet people. A few more words from Kubasov, and then the commander nudged him and said, okay, enough, and they boarded an elevator for the slow ride up to the capsule. In just a few minutes, they'll be speeding above the mountains of southern Siberia and into space orbit. Richard Roth, CBS News, Moscow. President Ford is scheduled to watch the Soviet launching on a television screen at the State Department Auditorium in Washington. With him will be Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dubrinin, other members of the diplomatic corps, members of Congress, United Nations and Space Agency officials. Mr. Ford plans to watch the Apollo liftoff from Cape Canaveral this afternoon in the Oval Office. Reed Collins is standing by at the Cape now with the latest on that event. The sun has climbed well out of the Atlantic now, drenching the launch pad 39B where the Saturn 1B rocket stands. The last of its kind to leave. On tons of oxygen and fuel for the flight. And now it's crew, staff at Stake and Brand are sleeping in the crew quarters as far as NASA is able to determine their role not yet written into this play. Here at the launch area, non-essential personnel have been cleared for the final fuel loading, and the launch team is giving Vicodor the final status report on the Saturn Apollo preparations. A bright blue sky with some feathers of clouds covers it all, and the weathermen believe the afternoon thunderclouds will not arrive before the Apollo is launched. But that all hangs, of course, on what happens in the next few minutes, 9,800 miles away in Central Asia. This is Reed Collins, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. The launching from Cape Canaveral, if all continues to go well, is scheduled for 3.50 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. News, a meeting in space. This is George Herman at CBS News Space Headquarters in New York. Less than five minutes to go now to the historic launching of the Soyuz spacecraft from the Baikonur Space Complex in the Soviet Union. A historic first, the first ever to be broadcast not only to the world, but to the Russian people of the Soviet Union as well. First, though, moments ago, President Ford and Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin appeared before newsmen at the State Department and both praised the mission. Here's President Ford. 
As has been said, uh, shortly after 3 o'clock this afternoon, America's Apollo spacecraft will be launched from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral. And these two voyagers in space will rendezvous historically two days from now and thereafter circle the globe together. It's my judgment that this joint space mission is a truly historic occasion. In my pre-launch message to the American astronauts and to the Soviet cosmonauts, I told them that they are opening a new era in the exploration of space and the blazing of a brand new trail, trial, trail of international space cooperation. Watching the two space launching separated by 9,000 miles within several hours is like seeing a science fiction becoming a fact. I have just returned a few hours from Moscow, and I can tell you that the atmosphere of great interest and expectation prevails in my country. Soyuz and Apollo, Alexei Leonov and Valery uh, Kubasov, Thomas Dofford, Mans Brand, and, the, uh, and Donald Clayton are on everybody's mind. Millions of people watch the latest TV news from Bancanor and Cape Canaveral. Actually, the whole country is taking part in counting down. Three minutes to go now, and we switch to Moscow and CBS News correspondent Richard Roth. Dick? George Soyuz Commander Alexei Leonov and Flight Engineer Valery Kubasov reclining their couches inside the small launch and descent module that's perched atop the 162-foot-tall rocket. There's no special name for the rocket. The Russians call it simply the Soyuz Launch Vehicle. And it's not too different from the rocket that was used 14 years ago to boost Yuri Gagarin into orbit as man, in man's first space mission. It's a tall, thin white structure with a red band around the middle and a mast at the side of the rocket that carries liquid oxygen propellant into the 24 engine. And from what we know of the rocket, that mast and the liquid oxygen connecting lines won't fall away until the ship is actually off the ground. At the bottom of the rocket, four long, cigar-shaped parts they're just visible. The rocket is hidden partially. It's sunk into a pit about 20 feet deep in the ground. Those cigar-shaped parts are the strap-on engines, and they fall away shortly after launch as the staging process begins. Interesting about the start of this rocket launch that's different from the Saturn launch vehicle carrying the Apollo is the fact that the Soyuz rocket is standing alone. There are no hold-down arms to restrain it, just four counterweights that will fall away from the rocket as soon as it develops enough thrust to move off the pad. We can hear some interpretation of what uh, Moscow Mission Control is saying. Now, the booster tanks, or the oxidizer tanks on the booster rocket are being vented. One and a half minutes remaining before launch. With one and a half minutes remaining before launch, everything here has been reported smooth all morning. As I was saying, the uh, counterweights fall away just as the rocket begins to develop enough thrust to move off the ground. And since the rocket is not restrained by any hold-down arms in the way the uh, American vehicle is, aiming it becomes a little more difficult one minute before launch now. And the aiming of this rocket is accomplished by a launch pad that tilts slightly, so the rocket is slightly inclined and it will be taken off over the mountains of southern Siberia. The mass, now support mass carrying a propellant has just fallen away. 30 seconds before launch. The launch command has been given. The launch command has now been given. This means that Soyuz is now committed to launch. Soyuz is standing completely alone now. It's just a, a silver white pencil standing in the middle of the, the desert near the Baikonur Cosmodrome. There's a description now from Moscow Mission Control. The power, the engines are powered up. Four counterweights have just fallen away at the, at the flash of light, and the rocket is moving off the launch pad. Moscow time, 15 hours, 20 minutes, 10 seconds. The flight is proceeding normally. And Moscow Mission Control says the flight is proceeding normally. George? All right, Richard, what do we get next from Moscow? 
The next thing that we'll see will be the uh, confirmation that four of those strap-on engines have fallen away. That's essentially the first stage of this rocket, which has fired successfully. When we hear that, when we hear that, we'll know whether the uh, the flight is continuing on course. It's headed now over the uh, mountains of southern Siberia towards the Chinese border. All right. About uh, how long into the flight did the engines, the strap-on engines, fall off? Two minutes into the flight, George, the strap-on engines should fall off, and we should have confirmation that the uh, core of the second stage of the rocket is still firing. That will continue for another six minutes and 40 seconds. We now have 70 seconds into the uh, liftoff, and then the third stage will ignite, and that should burn for another four minutes. In other words, about 13 minutes into orbit. Okay, uh, standing by at the Cape, Reed Collins. Reed? George? Yes. People down here are very much excited over it. Uh, we've had quite a bit of activity, and... Uh, are you getting any more information than we are? Applause. Are you getting any more information than we are, or does it all come through the one Soviet commentator? It comes through the one line, uh, through the one interpreted line, George, and uh, we don't hear any more than you do. But uh, uh, the same general scene uh, is being followed out over the Central Asian place that we follow out over here, except that we have the advantage of being over water. And if they have to come down, they have to come down on land, which they, of course, have planned to do if they had to. Also, you don't have to tilt the whole flight pad to <laughs> direct your rocket. <laughs> well, no, of course, it is guided and steerable uh, itself. Must make, it, must make it a little difficult for the Russians if they want to change the course of their rocket. They have to build a whole new launch pad. Well, I, I think that they uh, they have uh, considerably sophisticated steering mechanisms. They get into that rather high, inclined plane, which takes a little more energy. Okay, uh, 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 Dick, Dick Roth and Moscow. Come in. We have confirmation now that the strap-on engines have fallen away, that the uh, crew is feeling an overload from the, uh, the G-forces of liftoff, and that the uh, second stage is burning normally. Now, that second stage is what we would still call part of the first stage. It's the central engine of the first stage, or have they separated the second stage altogether? It's the, it's the core that comes right in the middle of those four strap-on stages. We call it a first stage. They consider the strap-on a first stage. Yeah. So we really consider it to be sort of a two-and-a-half-stage rocket. That would be correct, yeah. All right. Uh, when, do, when do the Soviets... Uh, people think they will announce the, cor the course that has been achieved uh, by the uh, takeoff rocket. That's one of those imponderables. This is still <laughs> considered one of, by the Soviet side, a unilateral part of the mission in some kind of metaphysical distinction that's drawn. And there hasn't been a great deal of detail about Soviet rocket launches that's been given to us. The second stage engines are operating. I'm trying to listen with you to the uh, Soviet commentator. George and Richard, uh, this is Reed at the Cape. Uh, their rocket is a lot like our old Atlas, really, uh, in staging and in using the strap-on idea and uh, igniting almost everything at once. Right, Reed. And the disadvantage of that, of course, is that uh, their liquid oxygen propellant is also controlled by one pump that feeds each of the four engines in each stage. If the pump goes bad, that, moves, that means all four engines are lost. Well, as far as everybody can determine, they, uh, they've gotten off on time and apparently in the right direction, and uh, that's most of the battle, isn't it? So you, in about another four or five minutes, uh, should start launching, to start loading, rather, your cryogenic fuels down there at the Cape Reef? That's correct. Uh, this uh, it has a, a little bit of expandability to it. It's a hot day, and I imagine Paul Donnelly and the other people don't want to put it all in there too quickly and then stand around. There's no boxing, and there's no confirmation that the actual propeller has started loading. One thing that we haven't had yet, we've had word that the flight is proceeding normally, but we haven't heard much from the uh, pilot Leonov and the flight engineer Kubasov, and there were plans originally for us to hear from them. We do know that our flight director, Alexei Le uh, Yeliseyev, is uh, at Moscow Mission Control, and... Uh, he's been uh, nodding and uh, doesn't seem at all worried. Seems that everything is going well, though. Well, it's, uh, it's a good sign, I guess, if you have to study the Kremlin, the Kremlinologist by nods and smiles. 
Too bad we can't get the detail that we get to those endless reports that sometimes seems from the voice of Apollo down at the Cape. George and yes, Dick, I believe we do have confirmation of staging. That is, they have dropped uh, the, the first uh, stage, which we call the half stage, and now they're on the, the final flight plan. And this puts them past the point where the April launch got into trouble and couldn't get rid of the uh, expended stage, and they had to come back down, if you recall. That is, they aborted in, in flight. Right, it's gone now, beyond that milestone. We're now almost six minutes into the flight, and uh, all see, still seems to be going well, right, Richard, in, uh, in Moscow? All signs are uh, that everything is going well here. All righty, this, this space shot, I'll just remind everybody once again, this space shot is just uh, starting one day short of six years from the launch of Apollo 11, our first man to the moon shot, which sort of signified the end of the space race and really, in a sense, laid the foundation, the historical foundation for this joint space venture today, which both the President Ford and Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin once again this morning reminded us is an historic occasion of great moment, although I noticed that uh, neither of them put much emphasis on the scientific aspect of it. Reed, is the uh, opinion on the Cape that this is a, a scientific uh, attempt of any importance, or is it really more a political and diplomatic coup? Well, you don't say that uh, for publication, but I believe it's recognized that this, this is a political venture, and uh, they want to utilize it as much as possible. Therefore, it is festooned with, with experimentation, and some of it Soviet originated, and uh, some of it ours, and a lot of it unilateral on either side. I don't see why it's not popular to say it. It seems to be a diplomatic uh, advance is as important to the world, perhaps, as a scientific advance. I guess uh, politics is a dirty word uh, <laughs> in somebody's mind, George, but it's true. This is really the, the thing we worry about most and the thing that we're spending most of our income on is international hey, uh, politics, George, if you look at it in the broadcast. Okay, let's go to Richard Roth in Moscow. We have uh, word now that the third or the final stage is, uh, is, is burning normally. That should go for another four, four and a half minutes or so now. We are now past the point where there were problems in that uh, aborted Soyuz mission. Rockets now moving at about eight miles a second, and it's about uh, oh, close to a thousand miles away from the large site. Sounds good. Uh, Reed, we interrupted you. Well, no, I think we finished the idea of saying it is a political idea and that the concept is, is rooted in, in international politics and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I'll just remind everybody in the audience that we have listened to an historic first, a broadcast of the first, of the launching rather, a first broadcast of the launching of a Soviet spacecraft. First time, to my knowledge, that they've ever announced the crew, first time they've ever announced the time, first time they've ever set themselves up for having to admit that something has gone wrong. So we've had the successful liftoff of the Soyuz space rockets. This afternoon we will have the liftoff of the Apollo spacecraft from Cape Canaveral, which we will, on which we will again hear from our colleague Reed Collins down at the Cape. And then in the succeeding days, the additional details of this historic mission, the link up in space of the two spacecraft, the Soviet spacecraft and the American spacecraft, all part of our continuing coverage of Apollo, Soyuz, a meeting in space. George Herman, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. CBS News on the Apollo Soyuz mission. So far, so good. The spacecraft Soyuz has now been inserted into orbit. Orbital flight has been initiated. That from Mission Control Moscow is the first phase of the joint American Soviet space flight has come off without a hitch. I'm Charles Osgood reporting on the CBS radio network. The flight is proceeding normally with a word from Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov and Valery Kubasov after their liftoff from central Siberia less than an hour ago. Rocketing up to orbit above the Earth, where on Thursday they will meet three American astronauts who take off less than six hours from now. Back on the ground, readings confirm the success of this morning's launch. Richard Roth reports from Moscow. There are satisfied smiles on the faces of flight controllers at Moscow Mission Control with the Soyuz spacecraft now in orbital flight. Soon after Mission Control here confirmed the craft had achieved orbit, the Soyuz moved into the Earth's shadow and began to speed out of range with Soviet ground controllers. But before it did, confirmation from Commander Alexei Leonov that the Soyuz solar panels, the wings that generate electrical power, had successfully deployed. And from ground station to the orbiting Soyuz, the command, have a happy flight. 
Richard Roth, CBS News, Moscow. Actually, there are four Russian space travelers circling the Earth now, besides Leonov and Kubasov. Kosmonov Theodor Klimuk and Vitaly Sevastyanov have been on board an orbiting space laboratory for 53 days. More in a moment. Forty-six minutes, five seconds now into the launch of the Suya spacecraft. In area, I believe, that last report just a few moments ago, all continues to go well with the flight of the Suya spacecraft. Yes, David, I believe we're looking at what is, uh, at the present time, a rather monotonous flight. The uh, information both from the cosmonauts and from the uh, Moscow Space Flight Center indicates that the everything is going normally on the craft. There is there are no deviations from the flight plan reported, and everything is going normal or normally. It looks like a nominal flight so far. And as far as the orbit is concerned, it was supposed to be at approximately 140 miles. Well, right at 140 miles. Well, they missed it. It's 140.8 miles. No, that, mm, the orbit is uh, will change eventually into a it's a an elliptical orbit now, and it'll eventually change to a circular orbit around the Earth, uh, which would facilitate the finding and location of the craft and the approach to the craft of the Apollo Soyuz uh, Apollo rocket after its launch. Right, the Apollo rocket will start off actually with about 120 mile orbit and begin its chase. Right. Using its retro rockets, its quad rockets to actually maneuver itself. Rendezvous in sometime uh, late Thursday morning with a docking uh, schedule to take place shortly before noon Thursday. Again, all continues to go well with the flight of the Soyuz spacecraft. Now, uh, almost 48, in it, uh, 48 minutes from the end of the flight. Uh, we just had a report from uh, the Cape where the Apollo spacecraft, all systems are go there, and the weather looks good for the launch at this time. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Bob Walker, and at this hour, one half of the joint Russian-American space mission is underway and proceeding smoothly. Russian cosmonauts Leonov and Kubasov were rocketed into space less than two hours ago. Here's how part of that liftoff sounded with the Russian mission control description translated by a NASA translator. The booster is off. Moscow time, 15 hours, 20 minutes, 10 seconds. The flight is proceeding normally. The program maneuver of the booster rocket has been given 20 minutes into flight. This is Bill Larson at Cape Canaveral. The U.S. astronauts should be in the process now of getting up and preparing for their launch this afternoon. They'll watch a replay of the Soviet launch earlier this morning on videotape. And the countdown for Apollo so far has been going smoothly. The technicians here are in the process of loading liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in the Saturn 1B rocket. The weather? Some high clouds are moving in, but nothing to compare to the thunderstorms of last week. And, in a bit of irony today, the man who signed the agreement with the Russians for the joint space flight will not be here. NASA says former President Nixon was not invited. Bill Larson, ABC News, Kennedy Space Center. You can hear live coverage of the astronauts' liftoff over many of these information network stations this afternoon, beginning at 3.40 Eastern, 12.40 Pacific Time. Secretary Kissinger speaks out. That story coming up. Space Center. David? David Crane, are you there? Thank you, Ben. We're now two hours, almost two hours, 30 minutes. Hello. We got you. Go right ahead. You remember, you're on delay, David. And it's been relatively quiet so far, Harry, from what we've been able to gather. Uh, the cosmonauts uh, not saying much. Not saying much, and when they say it, anything at all, they seem to say that everything is going normally. Uh, recently, we've been only given... Um, pressure and telemetry figures and uh, we were just informed that they had removed their their spacesuits and uh, are in their light garments at the present time in the capsule and we just received a report from uh, the cape a few moments ago all continues to go well for the countdown of the launch of the apollo spacecraft this afternoon at 250 again the possibility of thunderstorms or lightning in the area has been uh, reduced out to less than 20 percent conditions most favorable for a launch there. That continues to go well. 
uh, the Soyuz spacecraft in a good orbit. If things continue along this line, we can expect by Thursday morning the Apollo spacecraft to uh, have caught up with the Soyuz and begun ro uh, rendezvous procedures and uh, we'll close in and dock with the Soyuz spacecraft shortly before noon Thursday. Harry? Uh, I'd like to point out, uh, David, that uh, there's a report that the, uh, the Soyuz craft lifted off 10 seconds late, 10 seconds after the uh, appointed time of liftoff. It might be necessary for the Apollo craft also to adjust its schedule, and this might change the flight of the Apollo just slightly. Um, that question was posed a few moments ago to uh, some NASA officials in the news center here. They have indicated that it was, if indeed there was a delay of a few seconds, that it probably would not affect the time of our launching. That has just come in, uh, but there was an indication that the uh, Soviets did have a few seconds delay. Okay, David, can you hear me now? David, can you hear me? 10 milliseconds. David Crane. <laughs> Now, were you saying that there is a possibility of a delay with the uh, with the Apollo launch? Uh, probably not. Uh, there was some concern about that a couple of hours ago. There was an, uh, an indication that the uh, Soyuz launched a few seconds late. Uh, if indeed that was the case, it is not going to affect our launch time. We're, we're still looking at 2.50 at this time. Uh, David... Extremely minor delay, and we've also got to keep in mind that the Soviet spacecraft, well, it may appear to be somewhat late on the launch, but their spacecraft has launched. Uh, the swing arms pull back uh, a minute before the launch, and once the uh, rockets reach the power to uh, lift off from Earth or to escape or, or to become maximized the 1G, then it just takes off on its own. Where we sit there and build up, our ignition actually comes on the 1B some three seconds before the actual liftoff time. So we have ignition at three seconds uh, in the countdown, while the Soviets have ignition at the zero point. And what appears to be a delay there is nothing more than the uh, rockets generating the power to escape Earth's gravitational pull. But there was a uh, very minute delay. Uh, officials here, though, are indicating that it certainly is not going to be a problem in any way, shape, or form. Well, isn't there about a 14-minute window in there, David, where uh, they can launch uh, or not launch and still really wouldn't have any problems, just some minor, maybe, course adjustments? There is a 14-minute launch window uh, set for today, uh, so there would be no indication of any, any problem there. We, we really can't go over that time, though, to be in the, in the proper uh, orbit then to, to go ahead and, and dock with uh, the Soyuz spacecraft. Dr. Walsh, can you hear me? Uh, you cannot. Can I translate for you? Yeah, we have Walsh? not. Uh, ask him. We have not really heard any more about the the problem that Senator Proxmire, our alleged problem that Proxmire brought up concerning uh, the Soviets' capability of carrying on two missions. Does he have any comment on that? Uh, Dr. Walsh, the question to you from Ben Baldwin is this. Uh, Senator Proxmire indicated that the Russians could not conduct two missions at once. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Well, they seem to be um, uh, quite willing to make uh, such a thing. They have in the past, uh, it, during the time of the launch of Apollo, uh, sorry, Soyuz 6, 7, and 8, had three missions in the air at the same time. Three missions going at once. You sometimes get the feeling that perhaps the uh, Senator Proxmire's information from the CIA may have been somewhat lacking in some respects. So then everything looks good. Absolutely beautiful at this time. Right now we're looking at a picture of the Saturn 1V launch vehicle at the Cape and uh, beautiful skies and the beautiful blue of the Atlantic Ocean right behind it. Uh, the astronauts are most anxious. They're standing by in the waiting room now. Within uh, oh, about noon, they will begin their journey to the Apollo spacecraft. We'll go up the scaffold and enter the command module and wait for the countdown. And uh, within two days, uh, should be docking with the Soyuz spacecraft. Okay, David, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Yes, Ben. David. Thank you next for CBS and KLBJ News. At the tone, 11 a.m. CBS News.
The Senate has voted to extend price controls on American oil, which seems to point to another showdown between Congress and the President. I'm Richard C. Hartlett, reporting on the CBS radio network. Well, at Cape Canaveral, with preparations for the launch of Apollo this afternoon. A report from Reed College. The countdown is in a planned hold here. The Saturn vehicle fully fueled and the closed-out crew checking off the spacecraft prior to the arrival of the astronaut. Stafford, Clayton, and Brand slept through the Soyuz launch, but watched taped replays a short time ago during their brunch of steak and eggs. Aboard Soyuz 19, Leonov and Kubasov have removed their pressure suits and checked out the orbital compartment in which they will host the Americans on Thursday. The weather here is cloudy, then sunny by turns. An hour ago, some mamatas formations hung from the bottom of the huge cumulus cloud over the launch pad, signifying high turbulence aloft. That has been swept away now, and more, but less ominous formations are marching in from the sea. This is Reed Collins, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center. The countdown will resume eight and a half minutes from now. The Soviet Soyuz, now settled into orbit, has been occupied with housekeeping chores, turning the right switches, pushing the proper buttons, and as any housewife knows, not everything can be done at once. Here is a snatch of conversation between the Soyuz cosmonauts and Moscow Mission Control, interpreted by the official Soviet translator in Houston. Soyuz 2, we have been calling you for several minutes. How do you read? Oh, we didn't have our receiver turned on. We didn't have time to turn it on. Uh, we wanted, we should have turned it on, yes? So, yes, this is Moscow. So, you still, we read you well. How do you read Moscow? We read you normally. You have to do it yourself, turn on the transmitter. We were just busy flying, so we didn't have time. That word from Soyuz in space. Stocks and other news after this. from American Information Radio. This is John Grimes, and at this hour, the Senate goes... The countdown continues for the launch of the three-man Apollo crew as two Soviet cosmonauts orbit the Earth. The latest from correspondent Bill Larson at Cape Canaveral. Astronauts Stafford, Slayton, and Brand are boarding their spaceship now, getting ready for their launch in less than three hours, and a meeting in space two days from now with the Soviet cosmonauts. There was one incident early this morning to mar the day. When astronaut Deke Slayton's brother and sister and three other people were injured in a two-car accident not far from the space center. None of the injuries was serious, except for a broken leg. The weather is excellent, mostly sunny with some light overcast and a few clouds on the horizon. The countdown is going smoothly here at Kennedy Space Center, as is the flight of the Soyuz cosmonauts. Bill Larson, ABC News, Kennedy Space Center. Here live coverage of the Apollo liftoff beginning at 3.40 Eastern Time on many of these information stations. The U.S. Civil Rights... They have already driven to the launch complex at Cape Canaveral after watching a rerun of the Soviet liftoff. We now have a review of the day's activities from CPR News reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. Paul Astronauts, Tom Stafford, Lee Slayton, Vance Brand are preparing for their launch at 2.50 this afternoon. The Soviet astronauts are preparing to do a mid-course correction burn for that report and Harry Walsh. The, uh, in the fourth orbit of the Soyuz, there is planned an orbital burn, which would bring the Soyuz spacecraft into a circular orbit around the Earth at an altitude of approximately 224 kilometers. Uh, this burn is to take place soon in the present, later on in the present orbit. Preparations for it are continuing at present. There is an exchange of data going on between the Soyuz spacecraft and the man, the man, uh, spacecraft center in Moscow at the present time. The, we should have the beginning of the burn in a few minutes. In fact, I think we should point out here again, Harry, that this is a, a designed maneuver. It is uh, not a maneuver that is being forced upon them. No, it is uh, in the plan for the flight. It is designed to uh, facilitate the uh, the Soyuz craft, the location of the Soyuz craft. Apollo, once the Apollo is is launched, it will be easier in a circular orbit than in the elliptical orbit which the, in which the uh, Soyuz craft was launched in the first place. And we also understand that the uh, Soviet cosmonauts, Alex Leonov, Valery Kubasov, have just had lunch while they're busy going about their work, and what a fabulous lunch, Harry. Perhaps you know more about uh, their food style than I do. It consisted of the greens in tubes, some chicken.
American meat in cans, some bread, and for dessert, prunes with nuts. Is this a popular lunch? Well, it sounds terribly enticing. No, it doesn't sound at all uh, Russian, and, uh, but I suppose there are limitations as to what one can imbibe in the space. If they did have lunch, it must have been a working lunch, because uh, judging from the broadcast we've been hearing in the air-to-ground communication, they have been quite busy. Uh, if they had lunch, and if it in fact consisted of those things, and it would probably confirm uh, what uh, uh, cosmonaut uh, Leonov said recently when he was here. He said he tasted the American space food, and he tasted the Soviet space food, and the term he used to characterize them both is unprintable. <laughs> so they have some... All right, meanwhile, back at the Cape, again, the Apollo astronauts are on board the spacecraft now going through their final checkout maneuvers. We could have an early launch if necessary due to weather factors there at Cape Verde. Uh, unpredictable this time of the year. They could launch some 5 minutes 30 seconds earlier than the 2.50 launch time. They would not like to do that. This would not put them in the uh, correct orbit they would like to be in. Uh, they would have to do uh, probably one more of a longer mid-course correction burn in an effort to catch up with the Soviet spacecraft. They're still launch, but it is possible for an early launch, again, depending on the weather. The latest report, though, was that uh, the weather conditions at the Cape uh, were clearing somewhat, and uh, that there was only less than a 20% for scattered showers or thunderstorms. The fear, of course, is of lightning striking the spacecraft and uh, burning out the circuits. Uh, although the launch director there, Walter Caprian, has indicated that the spacecraft could take a pretty good jolt and still function properly. It's a, it's a hazard, though, that he would not like to go along with. Time, I, I think, uh, Harry, we could best describe this as a beautiful mission so far, starting with the Soyuz launch this morning at 7.20 and uh, going right into the preparation for the Apollo launch. Yes, David, so far there's been nothing in the Soyuz launch, which, uh, nothing has come to light which would indicate any deviance from the planned pattern for the launch. And uh, as far as we know, the same pattern seems to be uh, in effect here for the Apollo launch upcoming. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. And this is the Midday Report from KTRH in Houston. Our was from the misinterpretation of the interpretation of the Soviet launch this morning. I'm David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. I'll be back in just a moment to tell you all about it. Johnson Space Center with uh, the Harry Walsh, our uh, Russian uh, linguist, and uh, the Harry apparently there is some misunderstanding, or there was by some uh, interpreters of the Soyuz uh, launch this morning. Uh, apparently, uh, one or two other interpreters uh, took the meaning of the Soviet uh, spacecraft the vibrating somewhat on launch, took that as a bad sign, and were indicating that it was about to cause some problems. I don't think, uh, as you had interpreted at that time, uh, 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 Leonel, uh, his comments on that did not indicate that, did they? No, I think the only reference to vibration that I heard were, I believe his philosophy was referring to the vibration, but uh, it didn't seem to be anything other than the normal vibration that uh, accompanies any launch of a spacecraft of that sort. I believe it was fully within the expected parameters for vibration. It did not constitute, as far as anyone can tell, a, a danger to the lives of the cosmonauts. I believe as you were interpreting then, Kobasov or, or Leonel, Gotten which one said it, it appears to be well within the parameters of what they expect. So apparently this is a, a normal occurrence on, on the launch. Yes, there was nothing in the launch or nothing in the statements of the cosmonauts during launch that would indicate that anything was uh, abnormal during the launch. It seemed to be a nominal launch which uh, had few, if any, difficulties at all. One of the more interesting problems that we're facing here that I think everybody knew that we were going to face here is the confusion in the number of available lines uh, to the media, uh, the great confusion that is taking place, and quite understandably, I think, because there are some eight different lines that are uh, available to the media, ranging from a pure Russian to some translation uh, simultaneously to some translation uh, at a later date, if we can, type thing. And uh, all of this, of course, has to be coordinated uh, from also the Moscow Control Center. And one can understand the confusion that abounds in, in such a situation. Right. For instance, uh, right now, David, on the U.S. Our air to ground uh, channel, what we're receiving is, uh, is Apollo, uh, like technicians working.
working on the Apollo uh, coming across the USSR air to ground. Yeah, right. This I is the checkout. Temporary. Yeah, this is the checkout of the Apollo spacecraft. But apparently, what it seems to be at this point is, uh, oh, there is somebody here to tell us what is what has happened. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, now all of the lines are switched around again. Oh, this has been. Uh, <laughs> back to Moscow, which is a relatively interesting situation. They are apparently picking up our interpretation of their broadcast through some work of, of some form or another. So I think it would be best if we did not do that for a minute and let the technicians come in here and perhaps uh, repair the situation. Wise decision. <laughs> this is David Crane with Harry Walsh, Johnson Space Center, and hello to everybody in Moscow, too. ASTP, an exercise in detente. A special report from KTRA News. Hi. At the tone, one o'clock. Continue. Launch time is drawing near. I'm Richard C. Hartlett, reporting on the CBS radio network. My use is in orbit, waiting for Apollo to start up after it. That won't be long. Reed Collins reports from Cape Canaveral. The countdown continues without a hitch here at the Cape. The astronauts are strapped inside the spacecraft, where they've been making final communications checks for the past 45 minutes. Stafford in the left couch, the mission commander. Vance Brand, center couch, Donald Clayton over on the right. Below them, their Saturn 1B launch vehicle is sending white plumes of gaseous oxygen out into a bright day. There are a few cloud buildups in the Cape area now, but there's a great deal of blue sky overhead, perfectly acceptable conditions for a launch. If the weather will just hold, it should be the good omen for this space first. This is Reed Collins, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Almost forgotten, incidentally, in the excitement of the joint Soyuz Apollo mission is the fact that the Soviet Union has another two-man crew in space. They are the cosmonauts of Soyuz 18, who today quietly spent their 52nd day aboard the orbiting Salyut 4 space station. More CBS News in one minute. 